Namaskar. I am grateful to all of you who have joined today to remember the 92nd anniversary of the Sol Satyagraha, which was the most illuminating and major non-violent protest movement led by Mahatma Gandhi in 1930 that garnered widespread support and drew considerable attention and became an inspiration for many movements worldwide. I thank the Indian Mission and the Indian Council of Cultural Relations for hosting this talk during the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of India's independence. On 5th April 1930, Gandhiji had said famously, said, I want world sympathy in this battle of right against might. What was the battle of right that he had waged? It was the world famous Saul Satyagra, the civil disobedience movement that shook the world and established the power of non-violence. 92 years ago, on this day, Mahatma Gandhi had started his non-violent satyagraha against the unjust salt tax imposed by the British rulers on Indians. From Mahatma Gandhi's 1906 Transvaal March in South Africa to his 1947 past unto death in India, his career in peaceful protest was as diverse methodologically as it was geographically and historically vast. He had used all the methods like fast strikes, walkout speeches, and a revolutionary press, all played key roles in a movement that spanned two continents. If there was one high point of the Indian independence movement, it was the Sol Satyagraha or the Dandi March, an event so successful that at the turn of the third millennium, the Economist magazine noted retrospectively, and I quote, more than any other event, the Salt March exemplifying his tactic of non-violence gave India's struggle for liberation its Gandhian stamp. In 1931, Dr. Albert Einstein wrote to Gandhiji after the success of the Sol Satyagraha, and I quote, you have shown through your works that it is possible to succeed without violence, even with those who have not discarded the method of violence. We may hope that your example would spread beyond the borders of your country and will help to establish an intentional authority respected by all that will take decisions and replace war conflicts. I hope that I will be able to meet you face to face someday. Gandhiji had replied saying that he wished Einstein would meet him face to face at his ashram in India. Gandhiji remained an important influence on Einstein's life and thought. Under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, the Sol Satyagraha demonstrated for the first time the effectiveness of non-violent suffering in bringing about a change of heart in the British people and their government. Lord Irwin, the British Viceroy during the Sol Satyagraha was so deeply moved by the sufferings of the Satyagrahis that he wrote to the Secretary of State in London saying that he could not turn India into a sepulchre and rule over it. Irwin was emphatic that the British government had to come to terms with the Indian leaders. It made an impact on London and Gandhi. Irwin Parley's followed. For the first time, the representative of the King Emperor, the Viceroy, met the representative of the people of India, Mahatma Gandhi, the naked fakir, as Churchill had called him on equal terms. In a famous quote published in the Manchester Guardian, the well-known Indian Nobel laureate Ravinna Tagore described the Sol Satyagraha campaign's transformative impact. And I quote, those who live in England far away from the East have now got to realize that Europe has completely lost her former prestige in Asia. For the absentee rulers in London, it was a great moral defeat. Salt production and distribution in India had long been a lucrative monopoly of the British since 1882. Through a series of laws, the Indian populace was prohibited from producing or selling salt independently and instead Indians were required to buy expensive heavily taxed salt that often was imported. This affected the great majority of Indians who were poor and could not afford to buy it. Protests in India about the salt tax had begun in the 19th century and remained a major contentious issue throughout the period of British rule of the subcontinent. In 1930, it was decided by the prominent Indian leaders that whatever Gandhiji decides, so be it. Hence, press reporters reached where Gandhiji was staying with questions. What methods are you going to adopt? 
what is your strategy? Gandhiji said, I'm still understanding this. As soon as God helped me comprehend, I shall make the announcement. So the reporter said, and I quote, see what a wily person he is. He's not going to say anything. He wants to keep the government guessing till the last minute. And at the last minute, he will find something which will really surprise them. Gandhiji said that he had no trick except truth. For six weeks, Gandhiji had been searching and wrestling, trying to find a clear insight and program of action. His associates became disturbed, but like a flash it came. And as you know, it was enough to shake the country from one end to the other. Gandhiji chose the salt tax as the issue on which to initiate the independence campaign. He could hardly have picked an issue which directly touched the lives of more people. The New York Times newspaper had been able to report that in England, the India crisis is not yet a topic of general conversation outside of political groups. And in India itself, millions of people know nothing about it. It was not long before nearly everyone in England, India and the literate world knew what was happening. The chivalry of Gandhiji's nonviolence would not permit him to take advantage of a surprise attack. On 2nd March 1930, Gandhiji wrote a letter ultimatum to the Viceroy, Lord Irwin, which is probably one of the strangest letters a ruler ever received. In his letter, Gandhiji articulated action on 11 demands. Abolition of the salt tax was the fourth demand. Gandhiji had declared that he would break the salt act by marching from the Sabarmati ashram towards the Dandi seashore. He had addressed the British Viceroy in India, addressing the letter as dear friend. This was always a part of the Gandhian method. In his worldview, there were no enemies because he was fighting the evil of the system and not these individuals. It was delivered by Reginald Reynolds, a young British Quaker who was one of Gandhiji's disciples and stayed in the Sabarmati ashram from 1929 to 1930. Viceroy Lord Irwin chose not to reply to Gandhiji's letter. Instead, his secretary sent a four-line acknowledgement. And I quote, His Excellency regrets to learn that you contemplate a course of action which is clearly bound to involve a violation of the law and danger to public peace. When the British Viceroy rejected 11 demands, Gandhiji had articulated as the essence of self-government in his letter, he decided to directly attack the salt law, which taxed staple of rich and poor alike and also outlawed the manufacture of one's own salt as well as the purchase of untaxed domestic salt. In anguish, Gandhiji wrote and I quote, on bended knees I asked for bread and received a stone instead. Prior to the salt satyagraha, there was a lot of discussion in the country about why Gandhiji chose such an issue. Outwardly, this may have seemed like previous satyagrahas. What then made the salt march so distinct and successful? And how can its lesson be borne out in our world 92 years later? Salt Satyagraha's success can be largely attributed to mass participation of people in a non-violent way and provided ample advanced publicity. Gandhiji had ensured that the Salt Satyagraha would draw international attention. He let both domestic and foreign newspapers know about the purpose of this civil disobedience movement. And the latter's coverage became very important in gathering their support for India's independence movement. The media coverage even involved documentary filmmakers, a novelty at the time. Salt for Gandhiji was largely symbolic. By choosing salt as an issue, Gandhiji was showcasing the heartlessness of an empire that would tax something so basic and essential to the human diet. It served as a powerful symbol of a callous and cruel colonial exploitation, imposing burdens on the already poor millions. What was even more ridiculous, that salt could be made freely on the seashore, yet no Indian was allowed to make it. If ever a law could be unjust, here was one. Above all, given the essential nature of its use, this issue would cut across all areas of caste, creed, state and language. Finally, it was a powerful issue for the Indian women struggling to feed her family.
By making salt collection the central focus of his campaign, Gandhiji created possibilities of protest for people who otherwise had few political outlets, thus inviting hundreds of thousands to the struggle for Indian independence. The salt march also made local participation straightforward. As it was easy for people to understand, Gandhiji urged people for recruiting followers and offer resistance to the British rule. At one point, so many people joined the campaign that the column of marchers extending behind Gandhiji reached a length of two miles. Gandhiji had said that salt satyagraha would generate power in the nation to enforce its will. Gandhiji once again proved that he was no mere saint-like figure, but also a practical idealist and a superb strategist. This would prove to be his masterstroke, as it was a plan that was at once simple and brilliant. The salt satyagraha required detailed planning, and Gandhiji looked to his associates for their wise counsel and to take up the leadership in his absence in case he was arrested. Gandhiji left the final decision of the strategy prior preparedness and route map through Gujarat, the largest salt producer in India, to his most pragmatic colleague Sardar Vallabhbhai Patel. Sardar Patel toured the state, consulted with colleagues and finally chose Surat, the district that had given him the title of Sardar. As the salt satyagraha progressed, people realized that the decision was not emotive, but very strategic. Sardar Patel not only determined the route of the march, but through his own conduct had also shown the sacrifice that would be needed for the national movement. During his travels across the main centers that Gandhiji's march was to pass through, he spoke to the people and taught them fearlessness. The government found this hard to bear. Sardar Patel and his people chose Dandi seashore in the Arabian Sea to end the salt satyagraha. The marchers would have walked for more than three weeks to reach Dandi and would pass through main districts of Gujarat. The time frame was important to give a momentum to the agitation. The march would have a day halt in one village and spend the night in another. The distance between the villages was such that neither the new marchers nor the experienced walkers like Gandhiji would find it too strenuous. Having delegated the responsibility of deciding the route to Sardar Patel, Gandhiji was free from worry. He did not complain about the choice of the single place of halt en route. He was a disciplined soldier who demanded discipline from others too. On 7th March 1930, Sardar Patel was arrested and given a sentence of three months. On coming to know about this news of the arrest of Sardar Patel, Gandhiji issued a statement to the press and I quote, the fight has now commenced and we have to carry it to its conclusion. Our struggle must remain non-violent from beginning to end. Before starting the salt satyagraha, Gandhiji sent a cable on 8th March to John Haynes Holmes, the prominent American writer and an anti-war activist and I quote, peace under gravest provocation. No one even whispers about military resistance. No one arming nationalists. Civil disobedience under strictest restrictions being started on 12th. The names, ages and identification of those who were to march to Dandi seashore with Gandhiji appeared in the March 12th issue of Young India newspaper. The ages ranged between 18 to Gandhiji's 61 years. The Gujarat Vidyapeet, the university founded by Gandhiji in 1920, had deputed a vanguard of young students that reached the villages as an advance party and collected information for Gandhiji about the villages. Gandhiji, who understood the Indian villages more than anyone else, explained the economics, the ethics and the politics of the SALT law. He was to do this all along the route of the Dandi march. The march was a means of awakening the people. With the march to Dandi scheduled to start on the morning of 12th March, nearly 10,000 people had assembled at the ashram on the evening of 11th March. Gandhiji said, and I quote, I have faith in the righteousness of our cause and the purity of our weapons. And where the means are clean, there God is undoubtedly present with his blessings. And where these three combine, their defeat is an impossibility. We are marching in the name of God. God bless you all and keep off all obstacles from the path in the struggle that begins tomorrow. But you and I 
can return here only after winning Swaraj, or you and I must die in the attempt. The struggle may last a month, a year, or many years, but there is no question of returning to the ashram while the struggle continues. The morning of 12th March saw vast throngs of humanity moving towards the ashram. By 6 a.m., the whole route to the ashram and the Illis Bridge was lined with people. Buntings and flags decorated the route. At 6.30 a.m. sharp, Gandhiji followed by a batch of 79 ashram inmates marching in rows of three issued out of the ashram. Speaking in the evening at a gathering, he urged everyone to make salt and sell it from place to place after he broke the law first. It was a struggle of millions and millions must offer themselves as sacrifice to win Swaraj or independence. The Satyagrahis led by Gandhiji covered the distance of 241 miles to Dandi, stopped in 48 villages and reached Dandi village on 5th April. The group walked in the early morning, rested during the hottest part of the day and walked that evening destination in the late afternoon. At nights, they slept at village inns instead of in private homes. That way, there would be no retaliation against the homeowners who might welcome them. Gandhiji and the fellow marchers walked an average of 12 miles a day on dusty roads in the hot month. The villagers along the way provided food and shelter. Each Monday was a day of rest for the marchers and a day of silence for Gandhiji, as was his custom. Every day he spun for an hour and kept a diary. Each ashramite was required to do likewise. The marchers did not carry a single flag or banner. Gandhiji walked fast, but he increased his speed further to save himself from the rising dust and those wanting to touch his feet. Three film crews captured this walk and Gandhiji's fast-paced walk became legendary. On 5th of April, Gandhiji and the fellow marchers reached Dandi village. Abbas Tayyabji, his daughter Rehana Tayyabji and Sarojini Naidu, the prominent freedom fighters with a host of others were there to receive Gandhiji. In the Dandi village, thousands of people had gathered that morning of 6th April. Speaking to the people, Gandhiji said that at the age of 61, he had decided to undertake this march and through it, he wanted to spiritually and politically arouse arouse people. As the British historian Judith Brown writes, Gandhi grasped intuitively that civil resistance was in many ways an exercise in political theatre, where the audience was an, as important as the actors. The morning of April 6th, Gandhiji walked down the steps from where he was staying. He was greeted almost rapturously by about 4,000 followers who had gathered throughout the night, spending the hour before dawn in silent prayer, alternated by national songs. Gandhiji had a brief swim in the sea. Gandhiji broke salt plow in the early hours of the morning of 6th April. As he stooped down, scooped up a handful of sand and salt water and returned to where he was staying with a broad smile on his face. Shortly afterwards, the volunteers armed with spades and buckets received orders to carry on and proceeded in military formation to a neighboring creek where the salt deposits were thicker than on the beach. All over the country, salt satyagraha was now started with satyagrahi speaking and making salt from sea water and selling it. They were arrested and their salt was confiscated. But Gandhiji was left alone. Mr. Negle Farson, the correspondent for the Chicago Daily News, met Gandhiji under a mango tree in Karadin Surat on a sweltering afternoon in April 1930. Describing his first impression of the man clad only in loincloth, a pair of ancient silver rimmed spectacles and two hats, he wrote and I quote, anyone else would have looked ridiculous, but not the Mahatma. I realized as I sat cross-legged on the ground before the little man that I was in the presence of a presence. On May 4th, 1930, Gandhiji wrote to Lord Irwin, Viceroy of India, explaining his intention to raid the government's Dharasana salt works. At 12.45 a.m. in the night of May 4th to 5th, heavy steps were heard. 30 Indian policemen armed with rifles, pistols and lances, two Indian officers and the British District Magistrate of Surat invaded the leafy compound. A party of armed constables entered Gandhiji's hut and the 
English district magistrate informed that he had come to arrest him. There was no trial, no sentence, and no fixed term of imprisonment. The arrest took place under an ordinance. Foreign correspondents witnessed the arrest and Negle Fasin asked Gandhiji, have you any favorable message, Mr. Gandhi? Tell the people of America to study the issues clearly and to judge them on their merits. Gandhiji replied, you have no bitterness or ill feeling towards anyone? Ferguson questioned. No, none whatsoever, answered the holy man. I have long expected to be arrested. Abbas Tayyabji had taken up the leadership of the Satyagrahis after Gandhiji's arrest. He himself was arrested on 12th May along with Gandhiji's wife, Kasturba Gandhi. Sarojini Naidu then stepped into the breach along with Maulana Abul Kalam Azad and set about organizing the raid. Sarojini Naidu led the first raiding party to Dharasana Salt Works on 16th May till they were stopped by the solid wall of the police. Sarojini Naidu and her companions sat down in the scorching sun in the sand. After 28 hours of this peaceful confrontation, the police threatened to arrest Sarojini Naidu. She retired to the volunteers' camp to arrange for more groups to march to the depot. The others were then removed by the police. After her uh, arrest, the police led a severe lati charge on the Satyagrahis, many of whom were badly hurt. They continued the whole day. Sarojini Naidu was later released. The mass civil disobedience of the SALT laws in the meantime continued with full vigor throughout the country. Arrests, convictions continued and many important leaders were imprisoned. As the SALT Satyagraha progressed in the country, 300,000 people broke the SALT law all over India and 60,000 people were imprisoned. 1,362 newspapers covered the news. William Lawrence Shearer, the famous American journalist had spent a considerable amount of time with Gandhiji. Shearer asked Gandhiji how he was able to rock the foundations of the British Empire. The reply was, and I quote, by love and truth. In the long run, no force can prevail against them. Shearer's graphic reporting of the Sol Satyagraha brought to the notice of the world about the barbarity of the British rulers, and the world woke up to the power of nonviolence and Satyagraha. The New York Times editorialized that whereas Britain had lost America on tea, it was losing India on salt. Time magazine put Gandhiji on the front cover of its January 4th, 1931 issue as the man of the year. In April 1953, Dr. Albert Einstein had said, and I quote, it is a history of India's peaceful struggle for liberation under Gandhi's guidance. All that happened there came about in our time under our very eyes. Gandhiji's philosophy for non-violent action overpowered the British government and his actions influenced civil rights movements around the world like the defiance campaign against apartheid laws in South Africa in 1952, US civil rights movement in 1963, Cesar Chavez and the Delano grape strike in California in 1965, Baltic Revolution in 1995, Arab Spring in Egypt and Jasmine Revolution in Tunisia and many more. I once again take this opportunity to thank the Indian Mission and the Indian Council of Cultural Relations for hosting the talk. My special thanks are to all of you who have joined me online today. Namaskar. <laughs>